2026 might just be the year California's rail revolution becomes unstoppable. In this episode of Great Train Speed, we'll unpack the critical developments that make this year a game changer, from fresh funding to visible progress on the ground. The high-speed rail project is no longer a distant hope. Now, it's a fast-approaching reality that could transform the way millions live and travel. The California High Speed Rail Project heads into 2026 with something it has never had before, including long-term financial certainty. When the state approved a $20 billion commitment through the Cap and Invest program, providing $1 billion per year. Through 2045, it instantly changed the authority's credibility in the eyes of investors, lawmakers, and global rail operators. For a project that spent much of the last decade fighting for every dollar, this steady revenue stream is nothing short of transformative. This shift is already visible in how CEO Ian Choudhury talks about the future. On the Talking Headways podcast with Streets Blog SF's Roger Rudick, Choudhury described the new funding as the moment he could pick up the phone and seriously re-engage private partners he has known for years, and those partners appear ready. Many of them were waiting for exactly this kind of long-term financial signal before committing to a project of this scale. The Authorities Board will vote on November 20th to determine whether California should begin formally soliciting private investment proposals. If approved, the Authority will ask global rail builders, operators, and financiers to submit detailed plans showing how they would operate and maintain a segment of the system. Choudhury believes California could name its first public-private partner by mid-2026, something that would have been unthinkable just two or three years ago. Such a partnership would not simply bring new money, it would introduce an entirely new model for how the line is delivered. In the model Choudhury described, private firms would cover upfront design and construction costs, then operate the segment for several decades under a long-term agreement. The state would reimburse them through availability payments once work is complete, while future revenue from ticket sales and property development would gradually replace taxpayer contributions. This approach is well tested around the world. Nations such as France, Japan, Spain, and Italy have relied on similar partnership models to accelerate the delivery of their high-speed rail networks. A standout example is France's Bretagne Pays de la Loire line, completed in only five years by the private company Ifage Rail Express. California is now exploring comparable arrangements for its own project, but a partnership of this scale does more than change the funding structure. It changes expectations. With private capital in play, the authority could move from a one segment at a time approach to building multiple sections simultaneously, dramatically accelerating timelines that have long frustrated supporters and critics alike. And this is why the next piece of the story, such as state law, as well as the question of which section opens first, matters so much. With private partners ready to join and timelines set to accelerate, what happens when those partners start asking where the first trains should actually run? Do you think the starting segment should stay in the Central Valley or shift toward Gilroy and Palmdale? State law, specifically Senate Bill 198, currently requires the authority to complete a Merced to Bakersfield starter segment before anything else. That law was written to ensure the Central Valley would not be left behind and that early construction would deliver a real usable corridor. But now that private firms are formally in the picture, the economics of the first segment are being re-examined. The authority has repeatedly stated that while the Central Valley line has clear construction advantages, it will not generate the kind of ridership or revenue that private partners expect from a world-class high-speed system. A segment running between Gilroy and Palmdale, meanwhile, offers a vastly stronger business case. It connects to Silicon Valley and San Francisco through the electrified Caltrain network and Los Angeles County through the high-demand Antelope Valley Corridor. It serves two major population centers that already have heavy daily travel demand. It also includes some of the most dramatic engineering in the United States, the Pacheco Pass tunnels linking the Bay Area to the Central Valley and the Tehachapi Mountain Crossing heading south toward Palmdale. These sections are more expensive, but they also create the ridership base needed to run a profitable line. The authority made this clear in an August report that found a Gilroy to Bakersfield first phase would generate higher ridership, stronger operating revenue, and faster expansion possibilities. The report immediately raised concerns from leaders in Merced, who fear that modifying SB 198 
could sideline their region after years of investment. Chudri insists that is not the case. We can get it done, he told the Fresno Bee, but everything needs to be sequenced in the right order. He argues that private partners will not commit resources to a limited low revenue starter line. These firms want a segment that moves people between major cities from day one. This debate will come to a head in early 2026 when the legislature reconvenes. Chudri plans to ask lawmakers not only for more state funding, but also for changes to SB 198, so the authority can pursue whichever starting segment attracts the strongest private bids. The stakes are enormous. The decision could determine whether the first true high-speed trains in America run through farmland, through a major metro corridor, or somewhere in between. It is a moment of both opportunity and political tension. Central Valley leaders want commitments honored, investors want ridership, the authority wants momentum, and the legislature must balance all three. No matter what is decided next year, that decision will shape the next 20 years of the project. If the project shifts toward a business-driven first segment, are we finally entering the era where construction decisions are shaped by ridership models instead of regional politics? Just share your idea in the comment below. One for yes, zero for not yet. We are looking forward to hearing from you. By the time 2026 arrives, the California High Speed Rail Project will be standing at the intersection of multiple major shifts, including financial, political, and structural. After more than a decade dominated by construction milestones, lawsuits, environmental reviews, and funding battles, the year ahead could become the moment when the project finally transitions into a cohesive, full system strategy. The first shift is structural. For most of its existence, the project has been built in a slow, linear pattern. The authority could only build what the legislature funded, and those funds often came in smaller, episodic increments. That meant building the Central Valley structures, then the grade separations, then track work, then electrification, each step, depending on the last A, successful public-private partnership, changes this. With private capital in the mix, California could authorize construction on two or three major segments at the same time, something that has never happened before. The Central Valley could continue preparing track beds while tunneling begins in the Pacheco Pass and early grading starts in the Tehachapi Mountains. The effect would be immediate. More crews, more contracts, more visible progress across the state. The second shift is political. Changing SB 198 will not be easy. Central Valley lawmakers fought hard to secure the first operating segment for their region, and they remain deeply protective of that commitment. On the other hand, lawmakers in the Bay Area and Southern California see the opportunity to open a higher ridership, higher revenue segment. Early 2026 will become the stage for a major debate over regional equity, economic logic, and the long-term viability of the system. The third shift involves public expectations. Until now, the project has been shaped by renderings, partial construction zones, and distant horizons. But with a formal partnership and long-term payment commitments, Californians could soon see something much more grounded, clear timelines tied to private contracts rather than political cycles. Once that happens, the conversation changes from will it ever be built to how fast can it be delivered? Chudri's long-term goal is simple. He tends to operate revenue should eventually help pay for construction. That is how many of the world's great high-speed networks function, from Japan's Shinkansen to France's TGV system. If California can achieve that model, it will not just open one rail line, it will set a new standard for American infrastructure. This matters far beyond California. States like Texas, Nevada, and Washington are watching closely. If California can show that high-speed rail in the United States can blend public investment with private efficiency, it becomes a template other regions can follow. The year 2026 will not deliver test runs at 220 miles per hour but it could deliver something just as important, clarity. It will set the starting point, the funding model, and the pace for the next generation of American high-speed rail. It may finally turn a long debated idea into a system being built on multiple fronts at once. That's all for today's ride. Hope you had as much fun as we did. Catch you next time. Until then, stay chill, ride smart, and peace out.